Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 28th uh, Digital Rebar Meetup. Uh, we have, oh, there is pooling in this. We have uh, a ton of great content and topics, um, including a redo from last week uh, where uh, the recording got messed up. So hopefully this recording will be better. Zoom's been usually pretty reliable, and so I'll be monitoring it more closely. Um, and you should be able to see my um, uh, feedback, my uh, page on it, and I will put that in the channel. So if other people want to help take notes, you're welcome to do that. Um, cool. Any uh, community comments? I see we got a couple of new people uh, who, who are in, and welcome. Uh, any topics or things that people want to do from an introduction perspective before we, we dive in? Questions to put out there? Happy to, to front load items like that before we talk about uh, feature stuff. I'm getting a lot of quiet. All right. And Greg, did you have, were you in a place to demonstrate some of the pooling stuff or do I, do I, do I need to pull that? Well, if you're ready, uh, why don't you, <laughs> I'm not, uh, my, yeah, I can show my, I can show mine. That's fine. Actually, I think my system is recovered. If you can show it, that would be cool. Uh, you'd do a better job explaining it anyway. Uh, I suppose, I maybe. <laughs> All right. Well then let me have the screen share. I'm going to turn over control and I'm going to make sure that it keeps recording. And if people have questions or topics to add, just jump in and we'll, we'll make sure they get put yeah. into the uh, system. Nice to see a lot of friendly okay. faces. So plug in. See it and it's still recording. Okay. So one of the things we've been playing with is adding a new plugin for pooling. And it shows up as the machine pool. Machine pool. And the idea is that sometimes you want to machines um, and keep track of whether you've allocated them or not. So think of it more like um, your Amazon, I want an instance, and you can just get an instance. The idea is that the pool allows you to put machines into the pool, into the pools, and then allocate them. And then if they're not available to allocate, you won't get, uh, you'll get an error saying there's no more machines available. This uses the atomic operations of our API. And it shows up as, um, so you have to load the plugin, and then it adds some new parameters. Um, in the pool variety. Now a lot of these are really just parameters for the um, actions to operate on the pools. And we'll kind of go through those a little bit here in a second. Um, and so these will show up as new system actions. Uh, I can remember the type. And you'll see things like pool list and pool pools because I apparently am really poor at naming things. Um, add to pool, allocate machine, and then um, remove from pool and return machines. And the idea is that you can create a pool and you can see um, what pools are available. Run action uh, pool pool. So by default, there's a default pool. Every machine is in the default pool by default. And this way, just machines can go there. Um, you can list what machines are in a pool. If I can remember the syntax. So you can see those two machines, my two machines from the UI that I had up here, are in the default pool. You can then move a machine so you can say um, pool add machines. And this will either, you have to give it a list or you can give it the um, pool all machines flag. And notice it, that's something I 
have it configured correctly, which apparently I don't. Um, oh, well, yeah. Um, I'll come back to that later. But the idea is that you can add the machines to the pools and the parameters define what you can do to the pool. So, where are they? And the act, sorry, the actions also show the parameters you can take. So like when you want to add a machine to the pool, oh, you have to specify the pool name. That's helpful. Um, and then you can also either give it a list of machines in this parameter or set this to true and it'll try and pull all the machines from the default into the new pool name. So you say pool name um, temp one. All right, so I still have something totally screwed up on my system. So much for having something that I thought was working. Um, and the idea is that you would then move the machines into the pool. Once they're in the pool, you they're unallocated, so they're kind of not, not been assigned to do anything. Then you can allocate the machines. Um, let's see if this works. Maybe. Maybe my system's just really messed up with all the other stuff I was doing. Um, Greg, I'm, I'm, I'm checking to see if mine has got all the pieces and parts and I can, I can take over. Okay. The idea is that you can allocate a machine and as part of allocation, you can specify how many machines you want to allocate. The default is one. Uh, whether you want, um, so if you like specify 10, you can say, give me partial success. So if you only get five, return five. Uh, pull filter is basically uh, similar to the filters we allow on the other AP, like the list options to restrict the set of machines that come in. You can tell it to switch to a new workflow, add profiles or parameters to the machine or remove profiles or parameters. And then you can also give it a wait timeout and a wait for a stage. And so the idea is that this can be a blocking call to say, I want 10 machines run through this workflow, wait two hours for it to get to the complete stage, and in the process, add this profile. And then this, this call will block until all those things are occur or the timeout occurs. And as that returns, you get a status. Um, once it returns, you actually get which machines were allocated and which machines were, um, and, and whether they completed or not, find out. Once the machine's been allocated, which I give up on my system apparently, <laughs> um, you can return the machine back to, to the pool, which is basically a deallocate action. And it takes the same set of parameters, um, but instead of having it take account in a partial success, you either say all the machines in the pool get, that are allocated get deallocated or you can give it a specific machine list to give which IDs. And then you can give it the same set of parameters. So the idea is that upon deallocating it, you can say, have it go through this decommissioning workflow, wait for all that to finish, and you can do it on a bulk batch of machines that then move it back. The idea is that you could have multiple people hitting the pool API and machines will only get allocated to one call. Right? So it's using the atomic API. So if you wanted to say, I want to reserve a machine. It's a way to reserve a machine, have the API grab that machine, get that machine atomically so nobody else can have it, and then drive it through the workflow. And then the same thing with the return. And then once all the machines, or once a set of machines are deallocated, you can remove them from the pool uh, using the remove pool, and this will dump them back into the default. And the idea is that you have your default pool, and then you can create sub pools that move from default that you can then reserve or not um, and then put them back into um, the default pool if you're not using them anymore. Um, 
Yeah, so apparently my machine is just not happening for some reason. Um, let's see. Yeah. That's kind of bad. Um, there's also been some UI work to help with visualizing the pools on the overview page. You can see what pools are available, how many machines are in the pool, and whether they've been have machines available or whether they've been allocated and completed. And, and then as you add additional pools, which I thought would have worked, but um, you can see them move through the process and get visualization that way. Um, if you and if you define workflows, default allocate. De default dash allocate and default dash return, it will actually put arrows in there that allow you to do, um, mm. to allocate them. I think if you have the latest UX stuff. I do. Oh, there was another UX thing you flew past too. The yep. Yeah, there you go. Look at that. Well, it's it, <laughs> sort of weird because it's a my, workflow. My pool plugin doesn't seem to be working right now for some reason. I'm completely confused about. I, but that that's working in my demo. My other <laughs> my actual image deploy is not. But, um, but that's the overview. That's kind of the theoretically how the pool plugin is supposed to work. Um, I'm not sure, like I said, why it's not. So. So one of the, the things that we had shown a while ago was this Terraform. Terraform had the same behavior using different parameters. Um, but if you had multiple Terraform users, there was, there was Terraform should have been doing it uh, correctly and atomically, but it was every client was doing the pooling by itself. This actually moves it to the server, right? Correct. So, so yeah, each client was doing the pooling and hope and kind of hoping it worked in the Terraform. This actually moves it into the server as part of the, the pooling plugin. With the additional ability to specify a few more pieces and parts. So well. what, what happens what happens if you ask for like a hundred machines, but there's only twenty? So that's why the partial success variable is important. So when you have um, upon allocate, if you have partial success, if you ask for 100 and there's only 20 and it tries to get the 21st, it says it can't get it, and then deallocates all the 20 it had previously reserved for you back into the pool or makes it available in the pool, partial success says, well, if you can only get 20, then give me 20. This way you can say, you know, give me everything in the pool. Um, and so that's why the partial success flag is there. And what if I only wanted like machines that were eight gigs or something like that? Right. As far so as that's the, the pool filter is a um, map of uh, key values that will then be used to filter the machines. Where the keys can be things like parameter names or things returned by the inventory object or basically anything that works on your DRP, CLI, machines, lists, right? You can actually say like, um, hmm. let's see, do I have one here? Um, so, you can see, so like I can kind of cheat. I can say like this. Uh, well, you're supposed to be. I always, had, I always put a colon in there. And you can do equals to there you go. equal. So this way, it basically says if that parameter is equal. The other thing is, since it takes the syntax, you can do things like le. Ooh. I believe. Oh, so you could do like all, everything with greater than eight megs of RAM. Correct. Okay. I believe. At least you're supposed to be able to. Right. Yeah. The inventory stage is actually set up to. Um, enable that um, I have to, to, uh, yeah I think your no. syntax on so. okay well that's cool uh, not a good day <laughs> for Brian today yeah the, 
Oh, I don't know. But those are in the DRP CLI machines. Um, yes. oh. Or some of them. Do you have the use? Oh, well, that's why. Sorry. You just read the doc. LTD. So anything less than that can be returned, right? So you can have your advanced filters, but it's the same list of filters that you can use here also work inside of that filter list. So you can say parameter name and then the value is the string filter that you can have on. Right. But they can't they can't do deep uh, JSON. They it has to be first level. Uh, well, it's basically matches the parameters. So if the parameters are defined deeply, then that would work too. But no, you can't actually dive into substructures of, a, of an object. So. Cool. So, so there you go. I, I was playing with this last week when we were prototyping it and doing some of the UX stuff. And uh, that was super, it was super handy to, uh, be able to play with it and then just use the plugins at the action level. Um, it was it was really fun. Now it worked. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was confused. So if I go to overview, that's what you'll see. The objects return a list. So like in this case, I allocated one machine. You can see it came back allocated and the status is allocated. If I'd actually given the weight and the workflow and all those other parameters, it would have waited until it completed and either the status would have been timed out or completed. And the idea is that you can then get the machine that was allocated. Notice it just shows one of the machines. It, if you run it again, it, the UX should update live. Okay. Or not. <laughs> It wasn't where it didn't work on my system either. So, and then with the uh, return arm. Return machines, that deallocated both machines. So, refresh, there you go. And that's just basic. Basically, it. it's just a basic pooling system that allow you to move machines around and limit actions to subsets of machines outside of the tenant and role system. Did, did people have questions about this? It's worth opening it up for a... One of the things, one of the things I liked about it, although I haven't haven't really implemented too aggressively, is that you could build a pool, and instead of going into the bulk edit workflows and put something in a workflow, which is what I normally do, you could actually do it all from a pool, and you could move machines into into workflows completely from that one command, uh, if you wanted to do it that way. It's pretty neat, and return them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that. Oh, well, that one did update for you, though. All right. Yeah, I, yeah eventing is sometimes, uh, UX and events is sometimes a little funny. Anyway, so that's the. Uh, Cooling plugin. Um, one caveat on this is that the pooling plugin is actually managing a parameter or two on the machine. And so the idea is not to change those. You could change them manually, but um, for normal use, the Pooling plugin uses the atomic operations to set things collectively so that it can do them all at once and ensure that their values move together. So um, you can kind of move things around by changing these yourself, but um, 
realize that if people are racing or other stuff, you can get them out of sync. Okay. There you go. Well, no, it does allow you to um, recover things if they're messed up or if there's an error from that perspective. Yeah. So yeah, if, if somebody's waiting, if somebody does a pool allocate and doesn't wait for the, the system to, to reach a stage and there's an error, they still have the machine assigned, right? It's just it's right. errors. Okay. That's right. So the reservation is, like I said, it happens immediately. Setting the workflow and whether or not that actually completes whatever complete for a workflow means is um, an optional part of the pool. There's no actual concept in the pool of whether that's succeeded or not from a long-term perspective. The wait is just for that call. It's not a long running job tracking system. Right. And I guess some of that is because we're not expecting people to uh, use this as a UX or a CLI thing. It's really designed to be triggered by another system that's allocating and deallocating. So it would need to know if there was an error and manage it oh. or not if you want it. The pooling plugin is intended not to make that decision, right? If you need that level of functionality, you could build it on top of the pooling plugin. It wasn't intended for that sequence of events. Right. Because if we'd done if we'd done that, it would have basically restricted what you could do with the plugin. So this lets you That's make right. a choice. That's right. So we have somebody who's looking at using this to actually chain a bunch of actions. So they want to do the first one, have it start, and then chain some additional actions based upon the completion of the initial pull request. And so they're going to build something on top of it that drives that sequence. Of event. Gotcha. So this, so one of the things that I hear people ask about is like a CI CD system where it's going to go run a job, take an action, run a job, and then wait for that job to complete. This would be, then, then if you did that, you wouldn't need to know which machine you were getting in advance. You would just allocate, let the job run, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's what I mean. This is a big deal because otherwise, most of the functions that we've provided so far rely on you to know which machine you're you're going to do actions on, or let you pick the machine. In this case, now you don't have to. You can just say, "Hey, set aside some machines. Give me a machine. Do this. Start this work on it." That's right. Okay. That's right. And then you could use the UUID that's returned to actually monitor when the system's finished, or you could tell it to monitor for you. Or tell it to wait, and when it's wait. done, it'll return and tell you which machine is in that state. Right? Or That's finish awesome. Right yeah, so you could literally take you could you could do this and have a full like a CI/CD run that actually mach returns machines to a finished state, and you could just say, yeah, go do a run, kick it off, do it, wait until it's done, call returns at that point, um, and then the system's already now reallocated. It wouldn't be reallocated back into the pool unless you hacked the stages <laughs> right. to do that. It's pretty neat. That's really cool. Cool. Hey, while you're while you're here, before yeah. we, we jump into bundleize, um, could you show the stages UX piece? Because we made some changes in. Oh, sorry, workflows. Um, so workflows. Um, Which do you want? Workflows? Workflows, please. Because it's stages in workflows. <laughs> um, so if you edit, you can now edit the stages inside of a workflow and reorder them and things like that, which is super convenient. Um, you, know, you don't have to drag and drop, and then you can do reordering and move things around, um, even on an empty workflow. So when you create them, so that's there. And then um, if you actually look at the UX of that, it doesn't tell you about the reboots, but it also gives you a little bit prettier UX than we had before. Um, and then the other thing you've you've ha you already have it set that way, but yeah, you you can move open and close the tray. So if you're tired of losing the screen real estate for the stages drag and drop tray, uh, you can make it smaller, and it'll remember. So that was that was a long-standing feature request I got. Yeah, just, just playing, fixed it. Cool. 
Okay. So, given my success so far, let's go on to the next one. <laughs> Which one All are right. we doing next? So, the new contents function. Okay. I'm so, curious. I tried to explain this last week, and the, re fun, the recording didn't exactly take, so we'll kind of go through it again a little bit. Um, so, we added two new features to the content API. And so DRPCLI, contents, and there's two of them in pair. So bundleize um, is one, and its counterpart is convert. And so you probably are familiar with bundle and unbundle. And the idea is that um, it'll take a, a bundle will take a directory and convert it into a single YAML file that you can then use to upload as a read-only content into DRP. The idea is that you might have a GitHub repository um, and you're tracking all of your content and you want to bundle that up and then inject it. Unbundle is basically the reverse. You take the YAML file and it'll explode it into all of its component YAML uh, below. What we've added recently is Bundleize. And what Bundleize is, is it allows you to specify a file that you want to take some of the read write objects in your tree in your system and create a content bundle out of. And so the idea is I might say, I want to create greg.yaml. And so I, I just created uh, this workflow default dash allocate, right? So I can say workflow, uh, workflows default dash allocate. And now if I look at my YAML file, here's the, and I forgot to give it names for stuff, which I can do later. But here's my workflow, default allocate, stored inside of a content bundle. This way, if my preferred way of doing development is to use the UX and sit here and, and drive configuration to the UX, get that set up, once I'm happy with it, I can then bundleize that into something that I can either uh, inject into other DRP endpoints for propagating my config changes or uh, use bundleize and then unbundle to build a GitHub repository kind of file directory file system for it. Um, this allows me to um, basically create a content bundle from my existing content. Now I can name my content bundle. So all of the normal meta fields here are something equals in that. And then all the other values are basically type, colon, and then the name. So I can even do stages. I can do, I can even do machines though. Machines and leases you can pull out, but since they, in general, need to be writable by the system, injecting machines and leases as content bundles is not necessarily a safe thing to do. You'll just get very frustrated when the system can't update those objects. Um, this, uh, and so the idea here is that if you've done a bunch of development and you're happy with how your system's working, this allows you a way to capture that to then re-inject. The bundleize command also takes some additional flags. You can have delete, which will, uh, after it's successfully written out the bundle, will delete those objects from DRP. And then additionally, you can throw dash dash reload on the end of that, such that with the delete, so that it will delete the uh, objects and then load that content bundle into DRP, making those read only. So in this weird kind of partial one I have here, I can say delete, reload, and so now, um, assuming it's all come back, here's my default allocate. Notice it's read only, and if I go to my content packages, I should see um, here's my Greg content bundle loaded and replaced. So that leads me to convert DRPCLI convert uh, contents convert allow me to 
take a content bundle and inject those items as read write objects instead of maintaining a content bundle. If I delete my content bundle, notice the workflow is now gone, and I call convert, this loaded that content bundle as read write. So the idea is that if I wanted to load a content bundle into the UI or into DRP, but then be able to edit and manipulate its objects, I could use convert to load those as read write objects, operate on them, update them, control them, and then pull them back out um, using the bundleize command again. Um, that's kind of the gist of those two operations. Um, they were added kind of because we found that some people were liking to operate and edit inside of the UX and build up kind of their successful content, but had no easy way to pull that out and store it. Um, and this allows you to grab stages and workflows and parameters and profiles and all of that. Um, even subnets and reservations are uh, able to be pulled and injected. And like I said, um, same with users' roles and tenants as well. Um, user passwords will be a little tricky. So <laughs> realize you may have some issues if you try and bundleize a user. Um, let's see. So there's a question in the in the channel uh -huh. about what version this was available in. I think it's CLI only, right? Uh, bundleize. It is part of the CLI, and I think it's in three eleven. Stable. I know it's in tip for sure, but I I think it's in three eleven. I think it made. I think you're right. Yeah, so if it's a CLI only thing, um, yeah, I don't know how well, the, if, if the tip CLI should work against older. Actually, I'm wrong. It's, it's the first thing on the other side of 311. Oh, uh, okay. Now, bundleize is CLI only, and so um, you can try and pull tip DRP CLI and, and use it to bundleize something. It might might work on three eleven. <laughs> Which it maybe another release. Anyway, it worked got a lot of stuff. It worked. Be, so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, one one thing to be careful of with um, bundles <laughs> and endpoints is that um, we Thanks, added Mark. sorry, Greg, go ahead. Oh uh, that's what Mark did apparently. I think it's Mark. That's cool. Uh, the, what was it? Oh, we added some checks to um, make sure that feature flags were set in bundles. So the newer bundles, uh, actually, no, it's a forward, it's a forward change. So newer endpoints will not take, uh, are gonna check feature flags before they go and they take, um, uh, but, uh, content packs that are designed for newer systems. It's hard to explain. So content bundles can have now a required features section. And this represents the um, feature flags that are in DRP. And the idea is that when DRP goes to load this content bundle, uh, this is in 311 and beyond. Um, if the content bundle has required features, it will check itself to make sure that those content, those uh, feature flags are available on it. And if they're not available, the content bundle will not be loaded. So for example, this, my, this example content bundle I'm showing you is the tip community content. And since I pulled in some of the multi arch support, it expects to only work on a multi-arch capable DRP endpoint. So this content bundle 
if DRP tries to load it and it can't find that, it will remove it. Obviously, this is a forward protection. If you tried to load this on a 310 or a 39 DRP, it would still load, um, but your boot ends would go all kind of sideways. That's a very important feature, right? Multi arch actually changed changed enough stuff that without that protection, you people would take content uh, that would break uh, right. pretty badly. The good idea is that going forward, we'll have those protections in place so that um, content bundles can kind of prevent themselves from being loaded going forward if they don't if the requirements aren't available for them. Okay. Any questions on bundleize and convert or um, those parts? Like I said, it's pretty raw. It's straightforward. Those lists can get fairly long, but uh, it was intended to try and be a um, kind of helper to get you uh, to build your own content packages. We, we definitely had some people show up and say, oh, I've just created all these con these objects. How do I get them out of the system? Uh, and this makes that easier. The, the better answer is create them outside the system and use bundle upload <laughs> when you well, design them. Yeah, you can use, yeah, the other, I mean, that's the common way I develop it is I create my own directory structure first and then deal with it. Now, if you're not familiar with the directory structure, then sometimes the bundleize is a help to start that path. Definitely a good rescue for that. If, and if you haven't seen it, we do have a, um, uh, a training session on how to create a content pack called Color Demo in, in the GitHub uh, libraries that'll, that'll walk you through the, we have like an hour of videos and, and some reference, um, reference content you can clone. So. Greg, let me bring it up. Okay. Cool. I think you're, I think we were, the next thing on the agenda was the Ansible Tower, so. Oh, um, <laughs> It's all you today. Okay, well, that one I don't have as good a demo for, but, um, so we've started, because I think I took my tower system down for the moment. I uh, forgot I was supposed to do this one. Um, so we added, um, a tower AWX um, set of a plugin that has a content pack with it that allows you to have machines register with, I'm just going to say tower because I get tired of saying I view AWX on, um, tower, um, and then allows you to invoke job templates on behalf of those machines so that they will then, they can then run through and have power manage the Ansible and then get the results, but block the workflow um, while that goes through the process. And so there's a whole set of parameters that are used to define that. Some of those are used for the plugins. So the plugin uh, itself. So for example, if I wanted to add a tower plugin, I would come in here and say tower and notice it, make sure I have to have the login password and the URL endpoint, so like HTTPS, blah, 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 to get to the Tower API. Once you specify those options, um, you have access to some new stages that allow you to do some Tower operations. So you basically can do Tower Register, Tower Invoke, and Tower Delete. Tower Register, pretty straightforward. Um, it will, um, oh, and this actually lets us talk about another aspect of this, which is kind of interesting. Cool. Power register um, basically will call to the plugin and register this machine into Tower. It allows you to specify what inventory it should be put into, and if there's a subgroup, what subgroup inside that inventory it should, should join. In the process, the, the host object will be created in Tower. The interesting thing about this particular content pack is it works both on Windows and Linux. So 
you use this one stage and it knows how to operate both on Linux, Darwin, and um, Windows. You'll notice there's the equivalent power, powerful PowerShell script here that can launch it. The task, if we actually look at the tasks inside here, we'll see that there's new metadata that can be associated with tasks, which indicate which OS the particular script is available for. And so when the DRP CLI executes this task, it then uses the metadata present to indicate whether or not this should be executed or not. So in this case, this part, this script will get executed for Windows and this script will get executed for Linux. This way you can have a common potential, potentially common workflow or stage set that can be used to like register for tower and then do your operation. Um, this happens to be the register. Invoke, um, tower invoke. Uh, well, let's do the simpler one. Tower delete just as that, it removes the host object from tower for that machine. Um, and then tower invoke is the magical one. It does a little more. It allows you, if specified, to put the tower specific SSH, SSH keys in place. Um, for a specific sub-user. So by default, the access keys that if you're familiar with that, that DRP provides, puts the SSH keys in the root directory. For tower, sometimes they don't want to use root, so they allow you to specify, we allow you to specify the user ID and group that you want the SSH key that tower uses to be put in place so that you can put that in place and have it operate. That allows tower to then come in as the user it is expecting. Um, and then there's additional sets of variables that you can set, things like job template um, in the parameters. And those job templates will then um, allow you to specify the job that should be invoked. The system keeps track of the job ID that has been returned by the invoke so that if for some reason Tower decides to reboot the machine, which you know sometimes those playbooks can do that, um, DRP will check that job status, see that it's still pending, and instead of re-invoking when it gets to this point, it will go back into the wait state and wait for either it to fail, error, or be canceled. Okay? Um, and then there's timeouts uh, specifiable for that as well. The idea is that you can then stage multiple sets of these if you need to run multiple power jobs or however you choose to run tower in your happy go lucky way. And again, this works for both Windows and Linux and strangely enough Darwin too, which good luck on that part. But Darwin, Darwin, Darwin. Uh, but that's the idea of the tower plugin. Um, it's very focused on that particular use case. Um, so the question is from Chris, do the tower commands run on the DRP CLI machine or the target, they run on the target machine um, based upon how Ansible works. So from tower, tower SSH is in and does the playbook on the machine. All DRP CLI is doing is sitting there waiting for the tower job to become a uh, complete error or fail. So it's still doing tower and Ansible as expected within the context of tower and Ansible. Um, DRP CLI is just waiting for the status to change so that it can then cycle through the next set of workflows. So, so is, is the, where's the actual tower invokes happening from? So for security reasons, the machine itself can't actually do the invoke. It has to request that from DRP and then DRP will then, because it knows the credentials, invoke that on the machine on behalf of the machine. Um, and so the, the plugin is actually doing the tower invoke through the tower API. And then that status, job status is being sent back to the DRP endpoint, um, or no, no, the DRP runner. And it's gonna sit there in the task spinning, waiting for that to complete. Okay, so, but the runner is, but the runner is interacting. The runner, runner, runner interacts with the plugin. 
Yes, the runner interacts with the plugin and the plugin interacts with tower. That way, all of the credentials needed to act as tower are controlled on the DRP endpoint um, and then controlled by access to the DRP plugin itself. Right, this isn't one of those cases where the, the action is happening without the runner. The runner is still going. They're Correct, running. but the runner is not actually running any of the tower or Ansible stuff. Right. It's just waiting for the status to change. So, like I said, you have lots of tower options. Um, you can even specify, so um, group and inventory are used by the job creation or uh, registration. Um, extra bars, job template, job timeout are specified on the invoke. So you can specify what the job template should be, how long the job should wait within DRP CLI for tower to finish. And then it also, you can specify a map of extra variables that gets sent to tower because a lot of times a job template can say, well, do this Ansible thing, but oh, by the way, when you call invoke, you better send these extra parameters that actually define what needs to happen. You can specify that inside of uh, this extra bars field. Um, all of these can be specified either as a profile on the machine or parameters directly on the machine, or um, a lot of times what I've been seeing happen is you can clone the invoke template or a stage and associate a profile with that invoke that has the parameters that you need for your specific job template. And um, so like, um, if you look at this, you can see there's a profile part for a stage. You could, in, you could clone this stage, name it tower my awesome inventory job and then specify a profile that defines the job template and the parameters needed to run that job template. And then you can associate that stage with a workflow. And then you could chain a bunch of these together to do multiple um, job templates if you wanted to. Yeah, that, that, that functionality still makes my head explode. I think it's awesome. The idea that a stage can have its own parameters, its own profile and parameters so that when the stage runs, you can have it have some distinctive behaviors without having to create a machine specific profile. Is it right? Pretty cool. That way you can reuse your tasks and your other stuff just by tweaking the contents a little bit. That's, that's one of those features that sort of slipped in quietly to solve a specific problem. So. Like this one. Okay. Well, Sorry. <laughs> this is pretty complex stuff. What you can do with power. Sorry. The, the particularly interesting thing from a side feature, if you're wanting to go wander around, is the um, metadata on tasks. So those are, that's a newish kind of thing that came in. I think it's in 3.11. Yeah, I don't. I, I, that needs to get on my list for UX updates because we don't expose the OI, the metadata in, in stages here. Yeah, and the OS value is the GoLang OS definition. So, in case you're wondering, uh, makes sense because it's the cheap and easy way for us to figure out what something's running. But uh, so this is a three eleven feature, right? Where if where the where the runner will say, "Hey, this is my OS," and then if there's multiple defined, it'll send you the correct one back. Correct. So if it has no metadata, you'll always get it. And then if it has metadata that matches what you say your OS is, you'll get that template as well or that slip. So the idea is that when the Windows run, it actually doesn't get this rendered it actually gets only the one item sent to it as rendered. If that makes sense. The idea is that the filtering is done on the render side. So when you, on the uh, API call that says, give me uh, the task for a particular in, you know, moment, um, that task list is, uh, or template list really for a task is, filtered on the server side by the meta, by the uh, OS metadata. So, and the rules are, if there's no metadata, you get it. And then if you match, you get it. So 
In this case, a Linux box only sees the invoke power.sh. It doesn't see the PS1. Okay. All right, I better shut up now. <laughs> I, yeah, we're just about out of time. I, I tried to capture a little bit about that. There's, it's interesting with these advanced functions, there's, there's features that um, get sort of get slipped into the system that are super powerful that um, we don't think to mention in uh, normal meetups because they're, they're very sort of down in the weeds. Uh, but they're important when you have when you have the problem. <laughs> they're really important to know that they're there. Um, I, but yeah. I have conversations with people all the time, and there's just there distractions for the this stuff it can be a distraction if you don't need the information. Okay. Well, at this point, I better stop my boring rambling. <laughs> that was uh, awesome. I, t I got a lot of notes. Here, I'll switch back to uh, sharing. And then do we have community questions or comments? I can't see my own share. Cool. Is there, I, I'm trying to leave some space. Is there anything that's driving us to a 3.12 release in the short term. The architecture support is all is is coming in. Yeah, I mean, the, it may be just because we're starting to get some additional things in. Um, we're picking up some of the features needed to do a better image deploy setup, a richer, deeper kind of thing. Um, like if you've been watching some of the check-ins go by, um, while there's no really documented way to use it, there's ways to now have tasks try and execute um, into uh, a cheroot so that you could drop into a cheroot, execute some tasks, and then hop out of a cheroot. Um, this is needed for um, a more powerful image deploy set up. Um, uh, some of you may have seen some of the multi-arch support stuff go by. We're starting to plumb some of that through so that you can um, start seeing some ARM support and stuff like that, uh, at least become attemptable where it wasn't even attemptable before. Um, also, one of the things to, you may have noticed is that the tasks for register and delete um, with regard to um, tower, they're actually one line um, exec calls, basically, to say, run this action on my behalf. And um, in the tip of the tree, you can do things now like adding to the task list a run action call effectively so that those don't even have to be done as stages necessarily. They can just be done as direct entries on the task list. Um, again, there's not currently a direct way to add those kind of things easily just outside of knowing certain sets of uh, API magic to make those things happen right now. Uh, but things will come along that will take advantage of that more here in the future. Um, so that's, yeah, feels to me like we're doing a lot of things that enhance the plugin, the capability to, to leverage plugins. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the, and yeah. plugins are a bit behind the rack end and in, inside the engineering team is where a lot of the, the plugins go. Cause that's our extension. One of, that's our primary extension point by design. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. So that's, oh, and I didn't show it, but we've been trying, so you can argue how successful we've been um, on the whole doc pieces. Um, 
there are doc pages for the plugins and uh, content packs now. Uh, are you showing that? Sorry, no. Oh. Uh, I was I was answering Chris's question. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, you want me to show? Or sh give me the okay. ball real quick. Okay. okay. Oh, you're there. You're there. You're there. So. I'm gonna search for. No, no. Just go to the whole content pack plugin viewer area. Uh, let's see. Oh, is it? Uh... It's just yeah. Go to the top and then scroll down. Oh right. Section twenty nine. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, this is amazing. Yeah. Right. This so, includes our, the, both the internal and the public ones. Yeah. So now if you go to pool, if you click pool, for example, and there's your documentation for the pool plugin, all the actions you have, the parameters they take, what the parameters mean and stop. Right. And th so we, so this is built into the models and then it's automatically generated. So we've been doing a much better job of, documenting things inside of the actual content packs. And I them. think Tower has it as well. So you can see Tower as well. Sure, there you go. So you can at least read about and see what the operations are and the parameters and yay. Yeah, so this is pretty much all of the different pieces and parts. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'll let you, if, if people are wondering, you know, what the capabilities are. So, and then Chris had a uh, question since Kat has his tongue. Oh, wow. Shame. <laughs> it's extracted um, from code. Yeah. Um, so if you look at like provision content, um, I know we did this in, so there's a documentation link at the top level. So this is top level docs. And then every one of the, oh, this isn't a good example, params. Um, what's this one? There's, a, there's actually documentation sections. And this is all accessible. So if you're building your own content packs, you please use the documentation. You'll get this feature. Yeah, in um, fact, there's a, there's a new CLI command, DRP CLI command for that too. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to be awesome, but you can say DRP CLI content document, and then you give it the YAML file, and it will kick out an RST formatted file based upon all of the elements and with its documentation elements and other stuff. And that's what gets dumped into a place that gets built into the docs, but you could use it yourself if you wanted to. And we use RST just because that's what read the docs kind of cranks through. Well, it also is one of the few things that gives you cross references and table of contents and things like that. So you'll, if you look at the docs we build, we'll include cross references. Uh, so we get nice deep links without repeating content super handy looks horrible and get super handy yeah awesome top of the hour sorry no worries this was great a lot of uh fantastic information to share so um two weeks from now is our next one please in the channel um give us suggestions for what you want to hear more about we went through just tip of the iceberg on some really advanced features and functions. And we'd love to drive this with a lot of community input. So please let us know um, what's interesting and what you want to hear more about. Cool. Till then, see you all on Slack. Thanks guys.